not nothing. The show doesn't do things by accident. It is mine to hold the realm together, not sew it with further division. Here's the crown king. Uh, I would never, I would never. What a great episode of television. House of the Dragon, episode four. There is quite a lot to get through with this episode. I took so many notes. Unlike some previous episodes where it was sort of like one or two kind of like big themes or big kind of like character things that were really being developed. I feel like episode four crammed in a whole heck of a lot and it didn't feel like when I say crammed, I feel like crammed is never a good thing. <laughs> I don't mean to say that it was like overdone or it was too much or that I, I thought that they should have split it up or anything like that. Just that like episode four packed a punch. So there's like a lot that happens in episode four and all of it is pretty significant. <laughs> so as I was taking my notes, I was writing my notes in like thematic categories, which like in retrospect with this episode is, it's so hard to do because there's just so much and so much of it overlaps. I probably should have taken my notes just chronologically and just gone through the episode beginning to end and do it in that order. But I already did my notes in these thematic categories. So um, I'm just gonna stick to that, but there's a lot of crossover. So these categories by no means are like isolated categories. They, they cross over. The lines are super, super blurred. But first things first, I feel like the main character of this show, if there is a main character, which I don't really want to make the argument that there is a main character, but if there is one, it's Rhaenyra, at least right now. And a quick thing I wanted to note that isn't just from this episode, but it has been in every episode so far. And I really started to notice it now, or just really like kind of I don't know. I was realizing the, the pattern, I don't know, the music. I love the theme that Ramin Juwadi has written for Rhaenyra. It doesn't like play every single time she's on screen because that would be ridiculous. Not every scene is to do, is like a, a Rhaenyra scene, but the scenes where like something is happening with her that is like epic or it's very significant for her character arc or something like that. The music, I don't know if you've noticed it. I think it's kind of hard not to notice after a while. Not that it, that's bad or anything. Like I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's like Star Wars music, you know, like you notice the music, but like that's, you're kind of, you kind of should notice it. It's part of the storytelling. Once again, House of the Dragon wastes no time. Everything is part of storytelling. So anyway, Rhaenyra's theme, if you haven't paid attention to it, then you'll probably notice it now. It's this very like heavy drum beat with this very light feminine voice singing wordless vocals. And I feel like both, I just really, I mean, Ramin Djawadi is my favorite like screen composer of all time to date. <laughs> so I just like all, pretty much every mu bit of music that he writes for the screen outside of even Game of Thrones. So I just, it's once again, a beautiful piece of music by one of my favorite composers, but I feel like it just really embodies Rhaenyra so well because she is a force to be reckoned with. She's proven that time and again. I've pointed out several times now in my previous videos on the show about how much she's shown taking action, being a woman of action. She quite often embraces violence, but also the show frequently shows us how young, how naive, how at times, in some sense, idealistic she is. And I feel like this piece of music really does kind of show that duality really, really well in, um, in musical form. It's again, this pounding kind of beat combined with this light feminine vocal. So I just, I really like that piece of music and I really like how they're utilizing it. So what happens in this episode with Rhaenyra in general, more broad strokes, she's shown to be a lot more unlikable, uh, a lot more naive and a lot more out of touch in this episode. So we are shown many more things in this episode to make us potentially dislike her. I don't think the show is trying to get us to dislike her, but she is not a perfect heroine. Um, and the show has framed her very sympathetically for the most part and still continues to frame her sympathetically in this episode in general. But when this episode opens, I have on my list as well the fact that like she's fingering, she's like playing with the necklace that Damon gave her. And that's the very first thing we see, which is obviously significant in general and significant for the scene in which she's doing it. I guess since I've brought it up, I may as well talk about it now. So in this scene, the first thing again that we see the camera before you see anything else, you see the necklace and her playing with it. And then you realize that the scene in which she's doing this is a scene where suitors are presenting themselves to her for her consideration. So it is specifically while she is considering people she might marry that she is shown very like intentionally by the camera to be playing with a gift from her uncle. But in this scene, going back to her being unlikable, in this scene, she is shown to make fun of people. She's shown to dismiss people. The young boy who presents himself as a suitor, obviously, you know, it, it makes sense that she'd be like, oh my God, he's a child. Like, I don't, that's just, this is ridiculous. Um, so like, that's, that's fine. But he's very earnestly presenting himself to her. And in some sense, she easily could and perhaps should feel some kinship with him because she herself is young and is underestimated. And this young man is young and is clearly underestimated. And she dismisses him and she laughs when a bully makes fun of him, which makes, paints her in a quite unlikable light. Now, given the, the fact that this, this child's situation, I shouldn't call him a child, but given the fact that this, this young man 
is somewhat similar to her in so far as he is young and underestimated. I think it is significant that the show bothers to spend time showing us that as Rhaenyra is leaving, when it escalates into a violent altercation between the bully and this young man, that the young man is the one that prevails and, and wounds and I think kills. It's unclear if he's dead, but definitely w wins that fight with the bully. Again, I don't think it's insignificant. Uh, this whole like not judging books by by their covers, not underestimating small packages, etc, etc. So like, again, the show doesn't really waste time. So the fact that it showed us that I don't think is an accident. I don't think it's just for color. Then as Rainier is returning, uh, cutting her courtship uh, tour early, you know, much to the delight of her father, when Damon's dragon swoops by and around and down near her, uh, Rainier gets hurt by this. But her reaction to this is not at all dismay. In fact, she looks happy to see Damon's dragon. So just the fact that they didn't just show us Damon's dragon and her spotting it and then being happy, the dragon hurt her. So by extension, Damon hurt her and she's still delighted about it. And she has a habit of smiling when Damon does um, violent things. <laughs> This is actually, yeah, like, she's actually the one that's experienced, you know, to say experienced violence sounds a little much for what happens there, but still, that's not nothing. The show doesn't do things by accident. Again, it just continues a trend of when Damon does brutal things, and if Rhaenyra is around to see it, she tends to, at the very least, not be put off by it, but oftentimes is amused or delighted by it. And we see Rhaenyra at the small council, and she's no longer a cupbearer. She is seated as a member of the council, so her position is already sort of elevated or taken more seriously. Just again, no one had to say that that happened, but between last episode having Viserys say, no, you are my heir for sure, for sure. Now she's seated at the council rather than pouring wine is a noticeable change. And then again, back circling back to her being more unlikable in this episode. And I'll talk about this more in my other sections, which is why these, these divisions don't make a ton of sense, but whatever, we'll get through all my points one way or another. She's in this episode shown to us to be capable of deceit, which up to this point, she really hasn't. She's been rebellious. She has been in your face. Again, she's smiled when Damon has done kind of naughty things. Um, she She's, you know, snuck off to dr uh, Dragonstone without permission. She has not been shown to lie or to actively uh, purposely deceive. And she does do that in this episode, which I think is a big sort of shift in her character or a shift in what the audience knows of, of what her character is capable of. So moving on then to Uncle Damon. <laughs> Uncle Damon's uh, heroic triumphant return. So he shows up haircut with a crown on his head. Um, the hair, the haircut, I, I don't exactly know what that signifies about his character. I, I don't know if it's meant to signify that he's cleaned up his act or something, but I mean, the Targaryen men all wear long hair a lot. So I don't, I don't really get the significance of that. So if you have theories about that, if other people have put forth theories about what the haircut means, please let me know. But for that, I genuinely, like, I watched the episode twice and I was like, I don't know what the haircut means, if it means anything at all. And I don't think it doesn't mean anything because why would you have, like, have this pretty noticeable haircut and have it mean nothing? So that I don't, I mean, I think he looks good in the short hair. Um, but yeah, I don't know. But he does show up wearing a crown. And when he shows up, you know, he marches in wearing the crown and then he eventually does tell the king, you know, that he won this for the throne. Here, add the sword to the throne. Here's the crown, have it. Like, I've won this for you, the king. The thing is, though, if that was his intention, and that's what it was always his intention, and he wanted to signal that, that was his intention, he could have walked in holding the crown, he could have walked in presenting the crown, but he walked in wearing the crown and first told everyone that, oh, well, you know, they named me the king, but you know, here you go. I, I know that there's only one king. So he wanted that moment of uncertainty. He wanted to plant the idea and the image in people's minds of him in a crown. So, you know. <laughs> He does eventually kowtow to the one true king, but not before first being like, King, me, trying on for size? How do we feel about this? Okay, not not yet, not today. Okay, here's the crown king. Uh, I would never, I would never. Then much later in the episode, I'm, I'm skipping over him and Rhaenyra's portion because they have a section called Damon and Rhaenyra. So just Damon. He, the morning after events take place, she is with his uh, former mistress and she is, it's implied, is a spy or one of, the informants um, of Otto Hightower. And one does wonder how long she has been an informant for Otto Hightower. And then the last like Damon only thing is like towards the end of the episode when Viserys is confronting Damon. He's on the ground. This is the lowest he's been as compared to two Viserys in terms of how they are positioned in the scene. But his shirt is pulled to the side so that we can very clearly see 
the like scars from battle wounds that he has had, uh, the wounds that he's taken in fighting. So even if he's on the ground hung over and under the, the boot of the king, we're still reminded that he's a man of violence and a man of action with the showing us of these scars. Moving on then to my Damon and Rhaenyra section, which is a big chunk of this episode and of my notes. Again, there's some trends that have gone on throughout these episodes. I already pointed out how in general these episodes have kept sort of pairing them either by paralleling what they do, paralleling what they say, showing them actually in scenes together, getting along, like I've, I've talked about in previous videos about this. Um, they also have frequently shown them speaking Valyrian to each other. And this isn't the only time you hear Valyrian in the episodes, but it is pretty much <laughs> the only time you hear people speaking in Old Valyrian. And I th th this is always shown to be sort of like an intimate private moment, an intimate private conversation, and like something that sort of that binds them. It's, it's, it's like their thing, if that makes sense. So when he returns, they immediately go back to them speaking in Valyrian. And often that, because they do speak to each other in not Valyrian, <laughs> in the common tongue. So when they do speak to each other in Old Valyrian, it is usually about more personal things. Um, so perhaps, you know, you could say, oh, it's because they don't want people to overhear them when they're talking about private things. But it feels like it's also something that they just want to do with each other. Again, she has worn the necklace that he gave her in the beginning of episode one through the entire show. She's never, she's always shown wearing it. And obviously the very beginning of this episode, she is shown touching it. And one of the first things that Damon uh, notices about her when he returns now in this episode is that she is still wearing the necklace that he gave her. Uh, she remarks that he's matured, which is a little bit funny and ironic because she is, you know, the kid and he's the adult. So she remarks that, you know, his adventures have matured him and he turns right around and says, but she is matured as well in his absence. And during their conversation in Old Valyrian, it becomes quite clear what Rhaenyra's objection to marriage is. She is afraid and it makes sense that she would be given what happened to her mother. But also aside from her mother, I mean, in general, her, what she has seen in the court is, you know, women being sold off as property and then just made to bear a bunch of children. And so even if she doesn't die in childbed, that's still like, she's watched Allison. Like that doesn't look like a ton of fun. In fact, we did have a conversation, which in my Rhaenyra and Allison section we'll get to, but this is her perception of what marriage is. It's no surprise that she would be vehemently against it. So Damon already sets about telling her that while marriage itself is, you know, done for political expediency, coupling does not need to be a chore. It does not need to be torture. There can be pleasure in it. And you can't live your life in fear because if you live your life in fear, you'll all so you'll, you, you may avoid the things that will harm you, but you'll also avoid all the things that may give you pleasure. So he's sort of like setting the stage for further convincing. And then he does that night take her out on the town. It's very, you know, Jasmine leaving the palace and seeing Agrabah, although Damon is no Aladdin. <laughs> she, you know, sees uh, King's Landing and all of its glory uh, with Damon and Damon endeavors to put uh, proof to the his earlier words that there is pleasure to be had. And that he can be a source of that pleasure for her. Now, interestingly, Damon seems to be the one to be reluctant to sort of go through with this. Rhaenyra seems more than happy to go along with continuing their amorous doings. And it is interesting that he's the one that pulls away. I am not sure why he pulls away. I think it's possible that it's purely impotence because it was shown in the first episode, it was implied that he was struggling with impotence. So my reading of that scene is that that might be what's going on but I'm not entirely sure what his, what the reason is for his reluctance as because he's the one that initiates this. But then after that, Rhaenyra is the one that keeps egging him on and clearly wants this to happen, which is significant for later. But it is interesting that he's the one that pulls back and eventually put, puts a stop to what they're doing and walks away. And then again, this episode, aside from all of their screen time together, the, ep the episode does once again, pair the two of them by other characters' observations. So Alicent, when she's defending Rhaenyra to Viserys, she specifically cites Damon's deceitful nature as being different from Rhaenyra, but the audience is very clearly been shown that Rhaenyra is quite deceitful or capable of it. So while Alison is saying, oh, they're so different that Damon is the deceitful one, not Rhaenyra, the audience is like, no, they're both deceitful. Like, I know you're saying that this is what's different about them, but the episode is saying this is what's same about them. And in fact, Viserys' response to that is like, they both share the blood of the dragon and they are both restless. So he immediately put pairs them back together again and says, no, they're the same. And then before we leave Rhaenyra and Damon all together, I think the play itself uh, specifically is a very interesting part of the episode. So when Damon takes Rhaenyra out into the city and they see this like street play that's put on that's about the current political situation. I love when films and, and shows do this, although Rings of Power did this recently and it did it badly. <laughs> but when it's done well, I this this very 
pretty brief scene, it does three things. One, it shows us what the small folk really think about what's going on, because so far most of the show takes place in the halls of power. So we see what the movers and shakers think about things, and they may talk about, oh, the small folk want this, or the, the, the small folk won't like it if blah, blah, blah. But we don't really like get to see that or get a feel for that. So seeing this play and seeing the people watching the play, we actually get some eyes on what do the small folk think about what all their higher ups are getting up to. It also shows us how out of touch with the small folk Rhaenyra is because she's surprised at their reaction. And then when she dis dislikes their reaction, well, she dismisses it and says, well, it doesn't matter what they think. And this is when we see how in touch with things Damon is. He is not at all surprised about this play. He purposely wanted her to see this play. And he's the one that tells her, it matters a great deal what these people think if you ever want to rule. So in this pretty brief scene, we get a temperature check on the minds of like the common people. We get even more confirmation about how how naive, how out of touch, and how young Rainier is, and how much there still is that she does not understand about her position, and then shows us how much more savvy Damon is. And yes, he's he's a fighter, he's ambitious, he drinks, he whores around. He's not necessarily portrayed as a mastermind by any means. You know, he's the brute strength, right? That's his claim to fame. He's the he's the muscles. But he clearly also isn't an idiot. Like it's it shows that he has a lot more political savvy than at least Rhaenyra does, and more than you probably would give him credit for. So moving then on to Viserys. Viserys seems genuinely glad to have Daemon back, which is kind of heartbreaking to see. But when Daemon returns after his big, you know, crown removal and presentation, his first instinct is to embrace him. And he does throughout the show. We both see him do it and we are told over and over that in the past he has always given Damon another chance. He always gives him another and another and another chance. He's always defending him because he does seem to really care about his brother and he does seem to wish that they could be allies and friends. And even in the first episode when they're, when he's confronting Damon about uh, his behavior after the death of uh, Viserys' uh, infant son and, and his wife, he doesn't just say, you know, how dare you say these things, you know, I'm the king, blah, blah, blah. He specifically says, you should be here by my side. At which point it feels less like a, you should know your duty. It's more like a, I want you to be by my side. Like I need you to be my brother and you are not there for me the way that I would like to think that you would be. So Damon is not the brother that Viserys wishes that he was, but he keeps hoping that he will be. Then uh, later in this episode, we do get, I mentioned um, in my previous video about the previous episode, how interesting it is which parts of Viserys Alicent and Rhaenyra see. And once again in this episode, we have a very similar situation where each of them is presented with a very different version of Viserys. So when Otto Hightower comes to Viserys, we don't at first realize, but Alicent is in the shadows, listening and watching this exchange. So an auto Hightower comes to the king and says, you know, your daughter was seen doing stuff with Uncle Damon. The Viserys that Alicent sees is defending Rhaenyra and attacking Otto Hightower, saying, how dare you? You're doing this. You, you're, I can see that you're scheming. I can see that you're being ambitious. How dare you accuse Rhaenyra of this? So that's what Alicent sees. But in the, in the interim, you know, Alicent has a conversation with Rhaenyra and we'll get to that. But so then by the time Viserys confronts Rhaenyra, she gets the opposite. She gets attacked by Viserys and he is defending Otto Hightower to her. So it is reversed and it's down to her to say, I'll do my part if you do yours and get rid of Otto Hightower. And Viserys is the one that's like, oh, he served the crown loyally. Even though Viserys was the one when Alicent was watching saying, you're ambitious, you're out for yourself, which is now what Rhaenyra is saying, but she's having to say it to her father he's defending Otto against these accusations. So the impressions again that Alicent and, and Rhaenyra have of Viserys' thoughts on things and where his mind is at are, but are kind of polar opposite because they're seeing very different sides to him and neither has the whole picture. And throughout this episode, as these sort of revelations um, come to the attention of Viserys about what Rhaenyra has been up to, whether or not Damon encouraged this, you know, what all has been going down and the amount of times that he's expressed that they are similar. He says they share the blood of the dragon. In previous episodes, he has compared the two of them. And it seems to me throughout these episodes that Viserys is less worried about Damon hurting Rhaenyra or taking advantage of Rhaenyra or anything like that. He's worried about Damon bringing out in Rhaenyra the parts of her that are already like Damon. So he doesn't want her to be like Damon and he knows that she has the capacity to be. She reminds him of Damon. So having them together in his mind isn't that, oh, she's a sweet young innocent flower that's being corrupted or poisoned by Damon. It's that she's 
a lot like Damon already. And if you have Damon around, it's only gonna get worse. Then I think a very interesting line from Viserys, which is towards the end of the episode, when he's arguing with Rhaenyra, uh, or discussing with Rhaenyra the situation about Otto Hightower and about who's the heir and about how she's gonna need to marry, etc. When Viserys says, it is mine to hold the realm together, not sow it with further division. It's kind of an amazing line given where the show is going, what the show is about and what ultimately is the fault of Viserys. I won't say more than that, but I mean, again, I think if we're watching the show, even if you haven't read the books, you can kind of see where all of this is going. His every action does seem to be fostering division, even though he's expressed a desire to prevent that very thing. Before we get to uh, my Rhaenyra and Alicent section briefly, Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole. So it does not come out of nowhere. The show did a good job setting up the relationship, the, the trust, the bond between Kristen and Rhaenyra. And here the power dynamics are not what you typically see. She's the one with all the power. In fact, in the previous episode, he says, everything I have, I owe to you, which is true. Um, even, even if uh, that wasn't true, she is a princess and he is, you know, he serves the royal family. So that power imbalance would still be there regardless. But even more so than in, in any normal situation, he doesn't just serve the royal family that she's a part of. He owes his position specifically to her and feels beholden to her. And they're both young and they're both attractive. And so there's clearly like some trust um, and they, they seem friendly with one another. But it doesn't really seem romantic, not really, up until Rhaenyra is left unsatisfied by a daemon. So when she is feeling unsatisfied and like the, the lust that's been awakened in her has been left unquenched, she returns and goes for the first dude that she trusts slash has in front of her. And so at first he seems reluctant, not unwilling. So she's the one that's in control and egging him on and kind of ignoring his wishes. And he's not, he's not being forced into this, but she is the one that kind of holds all the cards and is the one uh, egging on the situation. And it's very clearly this scene, it is not a, a moment of passion. It is not just like an instant of just like, oh, they just like go for it. It is a very slow scene and they take their time. They have multiple opportunities to stop and say, no, we shouldn't do this. And at every instance, they decide to keep going. Both of them, both Rhaenyra and Kristen, because Kristen is reluctant and arguably has more to lose, arguably. She's a woman, but she's royalty. So they both have things to lose. But this scene definitely feels more like she's taking advantage of him. Again, they, they, it takes quite a while to undress him from his armor. Um, and the, the scene doesn't sort of skip over that, which it very much could have. It could have shown her grabbing him and kissing him and then cut to them in bed naked. But no, it specifically takes us through and shows us her taking one part piece of his armor off and him hesitating, but then allowing her to take more of his armor off and then him hesitating and then allowing her to take more of his armor off and so on and so forth until we get to him removing his own white cloak or maybe she removes it, I don't remember. But the point is his white cloak is removed and then he does hold his white cloak and place it down and look at his white cloak. And they specifically show us this scene to show him looking at the symbol of his vow, the vow that he is deciding in that moment to break. So then moving on to Rhaenyra and Alicent, another very fraught and interesting relationship. Now, again, we have something that's a little bit abrupt in the show, uh, a little bit fast. And I think it's clear that I love this show and I think almost everything about it is great. I'm allowed to complain once in a while. I did feel that when Rhaenyra and Alicent sit together now in Damon's return, you know, and, and Rhaenyra goes to sit down and then Alicent follows her and sits down next to her and they have their little girl talk moment. Given that we'd pretty much only seen them having a fraught relationship in the previous episode, it seems like they reconciled off screen because I don't think this doesn't feel like the conversation in which they do reconcile. It feels like there was some amount of reconciliation before this because they're they they're pretty easy with each other and the fact that that Allison feels that she can just go over there and sit down next to her and she won't immediately get rejected it, like it, it feels a lot more friendly between them even if it's not like it used to be so that kind of surprised and bothered me because like usually the show is pretty good about kind of like showing us gradual changes so that kind of felt like wait when did they become friends again <laughs> But in general, this episode um, does a lot to juxtapose their situations. A lot of it is not subtle at all, and it hardly needs me to point it out, but it is very important the way that it juxtaposes their situations, not just to show us the difference between them, but also to show us what it is that Rhaenyra fears, because she has a prime example of what she does not want to happen. She does not want to be like Alicent. She does not want to be kept in a tower making babies, as she says. It were shown again, Alicent, pretty sympathetically, that she's it's kind of one of those you've made your bed now lie in it but like she didn't really make her bed she was kind of pushed into that bed by her good old dad so she's shown in many scenes in ways that make you really feel for her make you pity her 
make you feel quite sympathetic towards her. And again, we very, very obviously juxtapose her life in sort of being the, the nursemaid caretaker of Viserys and also his bedmate and the very unpleasurable situation in their bedroom as contrasted with uh, Rhaenyra having her awakening with Daemon when she's in a pleasure house and he's telling her, hey, it, it's not just for making babies, it can be for funsies too. So we're, we're basically seeing the making babies version juxtaposed with the for funsies version, very, very obviously. And neither is actually looking, is, is ni neither is uh, made very appealing by the show, I'll say that. The way that they shoot the scenes with Damon and, and Rainier in the city, like that looks not great either, <laughs> at least in my opinion. So they, they both look kind of bleak. I would say neither of them really shows domestic bliss if there is such a thing. You have meaningless relations to make a baby or you can have meaningless relations for funsies but neither of them really shows you know like I guess if they're if the after those two are juxtaposed then we do see Rhaenyra and Kristen and if any, if any scene does show us kind of like a more idealized situation it's that where it's two people who know each other and trust each other as much as they possibly can have consented to this and are going about it in a mutually trusting and slow way. So if there is a scene that shows us happy domestic bliss, it's that. But that's also like the huge power imbalance and the fraught situation that that is and the vows being broken. That's that's also not ideal. But yeah, right before Rhaenyra goes off with Damon, the scene, what we see right before that is Allison holding her crying baby. And not only do we see that, but the way it's shot, I believe we're meant to understand that Rhaenyra can hear the wailing of the baby right before she goes to her room and is offered an escape into the city away from that fate. Now, when all of this comes to light about what Rhaenyra may or may not have been getting up to with her uncle, Alicent does genuinely seem to be concerned about Rhaenyra and does seem to want to help her. Uh, is also quite shocked by what she's heard. But I do think this is another instance of like uh, the way that this sh the, the shot is framed and the way camera angles are done that I think is very intentional, very interesting again. So when it's the queen who has summoned Rhaenyra to her presence, she sends Kristen to do it. So Rainier is the one that has to like come before the queen because she's been asked to. And when Rainier goes to see her in the godswood, the, the pathway is on a slope. And at the beginning of this conversation, as Alicent is accusing Rhaenyra of things, Alicent has the high ground and she is looking down at Rhaenyra, who's looking up at her and is the one that's saying, what? No, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you, what is this? I'm sorry. But then when Rhaenyra is accusing Alicent's father of spying and treason, they have switched. By this point, Rhaenyra has the high ground and she's talking down at Alicent, which I think, again, the way that they have a visual representation of the power dynamics in the conversation is excellently well done. And this is also a key scene because this is the first time we've seen Rhaenyra outright lie. We've seen her again be rebellious, do things without permission, fly in the face of authority. She's done all those kinds of things before, but here, she outright lies to Alicent, and not only does she lie, she swears on her dead mother's memory that what she says is true, and we know it not to be true. And so, so part of what she says is an outright lie. You know, she says, the demon never touched me, that's an outright lie. But she also says, I would never. And that, well, that's not, I guess, an outright lie. From what we saw of that scene, she definitely would. And she wasn't the one to walk away, it was Damon. And if Damon hadn't walked away, she would have been more than happy to let that continue. And again, as I mentioned before, after this conversation, Allison defends Rhaenyra to Viserys, specifically saying Damon is the deceitful one, not Rhaenyra. But by this point, we know Rhaenyra is deceitful. And it's Allison that is framed as the sort of like innocent one that really wants to believe in the innocence of her friend. So Allison arguably began the show as the deceitful one because she was going behind Rhaenyra's back and making friends with the king. But by this point, Rhaenyra is the deceitful one, not Alicent. Then a couple more semi-quick things. Laenor Velaryon, uh, the chosen betrothed suitor of uh, Rhaenyra. We don't really get to see him in this episode, but I just wanted to like call your attention to how they paired them uh, or paralleled them in the previous episode. So in the previous episode is where we do see Laenor uh, Velaryon for the first time. And in that episode, it, it's pretty small. Um, I don't I even know why I noticed it, but so very early in the episode when we're in the, the hunt thing, the hunt for the name day of Aegon, when Rhaenyra is in the tent with the ladies and the ladies are all talking politics and gossip and Rhaenyra snidely says, and how have you served the realm lately, Lady Redwine, by eating cake? And then much, much later in the episode, one of the, the first slash only times we see Laenor Velaryon, he's arguing with his uncle about strategy as concerns the Stepstones 
And what he says is, what role have you played in this council, uncle, other than master of complaints? So the way it shows them both kind of having this, they're the young and they both have similar attitudes and they're both speaking out against people around them. They're both like, I mean, we see very little of him, but you know, she's definitely shown to be a woman of action. He's clearly a man of action. He's wearing armor. He's talking about battle strategy. So I just think it's interesting how they kind of already paralleled them in the previous episode. They've also aged up his character, which given what they've done with the show, I think makes sense and I have no problem with that. And lastly, the episode ends with the, the morning after potion, <laughs> which I think is such an interesting way to end the episode and such just an interesting scene because we're left wondering who sent it. Of course, the maester says, oh, this is from the king. I seriously doubt that. I really don't think Viserys sent her a morning after potion. So if you were to say it's from the king, I think you might be able to get away with saying that if it was the hand of the king that sent it. Otto Hightower, which he very possibly arranged before he was demoted from that position. So my personal impression of that scene is that that elixir was sent by Otto Hightower by the maester as a test to see whether or not she did actually get up to anything because if she drinks it, that's an admission that she did do the nasty. Now, the assumption would, by everyone would be that she did it with her uncle, which would not be the case, but nonetheless, that's what they're trying to find out. That's a very clever way of finding it out. And it's very, I'm very curious about whether or not she's going to drink the potion because we're left with that hanging. It's been given to her and we don't know exactly for sure who sent it and we don't know what she's going to do with it. So I love the way they ended that episode. I love the way they left that scene open to interpretation or at least open to us guessing about what will probably be confirmed at some later point. So yeah, all in all, a fantastic episode. So much happened. So, and, and the fact that it was able to show us all of this in one episode without it feeling overwhelming. Like I felt overwhelmed because I was like thinking about how I was gonna break this down. But if I wasn't worried about trying to break it down, I would just be like, what a great episode of television. I can't wait for the next one. <laughs> That's, you know, on and on every single time I post a video about the show, I harp on the fact that they don't waste screen time. They, they pack so much in. And that's how they're able to tell you such a complex story in such a relatively brief amount of time. Uh, they really make every bit of screen time count. And it's, it's a glorious thing to watch. And I cannot wait for the next episode. But let me know in the comments down below your thoughts about episode, what is it, four? <laughs> Are we only on episode four? I feel like so much has happened, but you know, it's a great show. So let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. If you liked it, if you hated it, if you think I missed anything, uh, if you think I'm wrong about anything, whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times will be definitely Saturday, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.